tonight on Primetime Politics, China retaliates. We will not be intimidated. The PRC expels a Canadian diplomat protesting a similar move from Ottawa yesterday and denying Beijing ever targeted the family of Conservative MP Michael Chong. Coming up, we'll get reaction to China's move and discuss China's threat to retaliate even more. Also, Donald Trump loses a civil case in Manhattan, ordered to pay nearly $5 million to a woman who accused him of rape. How will this affect Trump's run for the 2024 Republican nomination? And... Our rights, these rights, are under siege. More money for reproductive health. We will speak to the Minister for Women, Gender Equality and Youth, Marcy Ian. This is Primetime Politics. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Sarabio. The federal government expected it would happen, and in the early hours of this morning, it did. China expelling a Canadian diplomat in retaliation for Ottawa's decision to declare Zhao Wei persona non grata in Canada. Zhao being the Chinese national identified by CSIS for targeting MP Michael Chong's family in Hong Kong. China's foreign ministry says Canada's decision to sanction Zhao was unscrupulous and they promised to consider even further retaliation. We will take um, whatever action is necessary to continue to protect our democracy and show that we're standing up for our values and our principles. Um, this is a decision we took seriously, we took with careful consideration uh, in order to, uh, to do the right thing and uh, expel the, uh, the Chinese diplomat. We understand uh, there is retaliation, uh, but we will not be intimidated and we will continue to do everything necessary to keep uh, our, uh, our Canadians, uh, keep Canadians protected from foreign interference. With his reaction to Beijing's move, we're now joined by Henri Paul Normandin, Canada's former ambassador to the United Nations, who also worked for several years in China. Ambassador, thank you for being with us this evening. Pleased to join you. So China is, as you know, promising to retaliate further beyond the expulsion of this one Canadian diplomat. What else might Beijing do here? Well, I think that Beijing will have to weigh its options. On the one hand, as we know, China has a very, conducts a very aggressive diplomacy. So it is in the realm of possibilities that it may want to retaliate in terms of uh, commercial links with Canada. You know, they might find some problem with our canola or our pork. Uh, not impossible as well that they may keep an eye on some Canadians in, uh, in China. So that is a possibility, but this being said, I noted in China's reaction when they expelled the, the Canadian diplomat uh, earlier today that they said to Canada, stop your quote-unquote uh, provocations. Uh, if not, we might retaliate further. So that might be a sign that China will stop there. Because in terms of considering their options, you know, if they impose economic sanctions, it also hurts them at the time when China's economy is not going so well. Secondly, it brings the international spotlight on this incident. It is a little bit embarrassing for China to see one of its diplomats expelled for reasons of interference at a time when many countries complain about interference by China. So if they decide to escalate this issue, it will shed more spotlight on the issue. So I think China will have to weigh the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Weigh the pros and cons, as you say. You mentioned monitoring Canadians uh, in China. I'm, wo I'm wondering if Canadian nationals need to be worried if they are in the PRC or in Hong Kong. And when I ask that, I'm thinking, of course, about the two Michaels uh, being arrested when Canada carried out that extradition request for Meng Wanzhou. I wouldn't go as far as saying that Canadians in China or Hong Kong are in danger. Uh, yet we have to be conscious of, uh, of experience. Also, there's a distinction between this situation and that of the two Michaels. In the case of the two Michaels, it was China's reaction to Canada arresting one of theirs, Meng Wanzhou. This is not the case here. So I would say, by and large, Canadians are not necessarily in danger, but they're not risk-free neither, given China's, uh, China's experience. Uh, in retaliating against uh, foreign countries. Further, China is currently clamping down on foreign firms in various ways. 
Uh, they've raided some offices, they've arrested some local staff, they've put in place exit bans. So it might be that at some point in time, some Canadians uh, may feel the heat in, uh, in China. Mm -hmm. Now, I I'm wondering how China views this country. And, and I ask that because here we have uh, this response, a, a warning that m more may come. And I wonder about Beijing's view of Canada. There are countries that Beijing looks at and essentially sees as vassal states of the PRC, uh, countries whose sovereignty Beijing ignores. How does the PRC view this country? Do they think that we are able to be pushed around? I would venture to say the following. Uh, they see us, I would think, as a weak middle power, yet as a useful economic partner, and third, as a close ally to the United States, if not a vassal to the United States. I think that that's essentially how they see us. In terms of economic links, uh, we have things of interest here for China, natural resources, technology, and so on. And further, our economy is closely integrated with that of the US, so that is of interest to, uh, to China. And to, you know, to put things in a, in, a, in a historical perspective as well, you know, China and Canada used to have a rather positive relationship. And I was part of that for a number of years, you know, going back to, uh, well, before me, going back to uh, our shipments of wheat during the famine, to early diplomatic recognition and so on. China used to respect us, but it's definitely not the case anymore. And they feel that, yes, they can push us around just like they're pushing around uh, other countries around the planet. So what can Canada do then? Uh, beyond the, this one case with, with Michael Chong, we certainly know other uh, Chinese diaspora in this country have complained uh, about getting threats or feeling that they're not safe in this country. So what can Canada actually do to counter the PRC's meddling into Canadian affairs? Well, the, the first simple thing to say is that Canada should decide to act. We've known for years that China conducts operations in Canada which are totally inappropriate or if not illegal. And yet we've let that happen in plain sight for years. And, uh, and you know, for, for the last few months, we've heard the government say, oh, well, we're sort of aware, but, uh, you know, we've conducted reports and investigations and we created a committee and so on. But until very recently, we had seen no real action. The only two pieces of action we've seen more recently are first, this expulsion of a, of a Chinese diplomat. And uh, secondly, we've been told that the RCMP has finally closed the uh, the Chinese police stations, although we don't have the details. But that is uh, as of uh, as of recently, until recently, we've just let things happen. So I think that we need to be much more proactive when we see things that are inappropriate. Well, our security services, our police, our politicians should be there on the ground to prevent things from from happening. I think that is first and foremost, uh, what should be our overall approach. There's a lot of talk about a foreign agent's registry. I think that that would be relevant, although I have to admit it is a little bit complicated, but it would be one instrument amongst various that we could use. And what about a public inquiry? As you know, that is being debated right now, uh, uh, possibly being considered by, by David Johnston, the former governor general, as he looks into foreign interference. Would a public inquiry help, at the very least, to make sure that every Canadian comes to know the actions of the PRC in this country? Well, I think that for sure we need a full inquiry which will go in depth about the activities of China and other countries as well and which also goes in depth in terms of what the Canadian government has done or has not done and leading, of course, to what we should do in the future. Now, there's a lot of talk about the possibility, uh, a lot of demand, actually, for this inquiry to be public. At this stage, it is probably the way to go because Canadians desire, Canadians had a thirst for, for knowledge uh, on that file and they want to know uh, the state, uh, state of the situation. So I'm, uh, if I had to bet at this point in time, I would say that Mr. Johnston, when he comes out uh, later this month, will probably recommend a public inquiry. But public or not, the important thing is that it goes in depth and that afterwards this information 
should be communicated to Canadians, respecting, of course, some limits in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, secrecy and so on. But the bulk of the information should go to Canadians. And I take example, amongst others, on Australia, which has taken a much more proactive approach in terms of communicating with its public on what it is doing in terms of interference. Henri Paul Normandin, thank you very much for the time today. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. To the United States now, where the former U.S. President Donald J. Trump has been ordered to pay roughly $5 million to E. Jean Carroll. Now, she is the woman who, in 2019, accused Trump of raping her years earlier in the dressing room of a Manhattan department store. Now, she made that revelation in a memoir. Trump accused her of being mentally ill and fabricating the story. But now, a jury in a civil trial has sided with her, saying Carol was sexually abused by Trump and defamed when he denied her story. To put this into context, we're now joined by David Leventhal, editor-in-chief of Raw Story. Dave, thanks for joining us so quickly today. Hey, you're welcome, Michael. So the jury, as I said, has sided with, with Carol, uh, and she is just one of at least two dozen women who have accused Trump of either rape, sexual assault, or sexual harassment. How significant is this decision? It's incredibly significant in that from here on forward, every opponent of Donald Trump, every detractor of Donald Trump, and certainly people running for the presidency in 2024 against Donald Trump, and that includes Democrats and many Republicans who are lining up to challenge him, are going to paint him with this, are going to hold this over his head and say, we cannot trust this man. We cannot put him back in the White House for another four-year term, knowing what we do know now. Now, mind you, this is not a criminal trial. This was a civil trial, as you mentioned. Donald Trump has been found liable for this situation, but he has not been convicted of a crime. He is not going to go to jail, and he will continue to run for president uh, for as long as he sees fit. Now, uh, Donald Trump has responded by calling this another chapter in the so-called great uh, witch hunt of Donald Trump. So I wonder if this will fuel his base or or cause his base to, to crumble. I get what you're saying about his political opponents, but what about those Americans who still firmly believe in Donald Trump? Oh, it's almost certainly going to fuel them going forward, at least in the short term, because there are many Americans who support Donald Trump and believe that anything that is negative against Donald Trump is a witch hunt. It is something to attack him. It's something to bring him down and also to prevent him from regaining the presidency in 2024. So just about anything uh, it could happen, and they're going to still be on Donald Trump's side. And recent polling plays that out. Donald Trump still retains a great deal of support within the Republican Party and within his loyal base. But if we're having this conversation, say, a half year from now, Michael, we could be having a very different conversation because this is just one of several very pointed and very dramatic legal clouds that are currently hanging over Donald Trump's head. Yeah, and let's pick up on that, because as you said, this one is the civil case, but there are potential criminal charges coming up uh, against Donald Trump. Of course, uh, we we know that he's been indicted in one for falsifying uh, business records to cover up an election law violation. That is the allegation being made against him in that indictment. He also faces uh, potential criminal charges stemming from the January 6th riot and for attempting to have Biden's win over turned in Georgia. So so future cast this for us. Going into the months ahead, just how how big of the stories is going to be in the Donald Trump saga as he tries to secure that nomination. The Donald Trump legal saga specifically is going to be the story because it's just simply not going to go away. You mentioned one of the four active criminal cases or investigations that are now dogging Donald Trump. Well, that might not go to trial until the end of this year or early next year. What's going to be happening then? Well, the primaries for the presidential race in 2024 will be beginning in earnest. People will be voting. Donald Trump will be competing against any of several challengers. And as a result, there's going to be almost this dual split screen situation where you have Donald Trump standing for votes and yet being in a courtroom or or having a court case decided potentially against him in the midst of all of this. So we've never really seen anything like this. There's no historical analog for what we're facing right now. And because of that uncertainty, 
I feel like we say this every four years, Michael, but this is going to be the most unprecedented presidential election that we probably have seen here in the United States. Which, of course, means you and I will keep speaking. Uh, Dave, thank you for this. Really appreciate the time. My pleasure. Thank you. The contraception abortion research team at the University of British Columbia and a group known as Action Canada will both receive hundreds of thousands of federal dollars chosen by the Trudeau government for their work in reducing barriers to safe abortions in this country. Now, the announcement was made earlier today in Ottawa on the same day that a conservative private member's bill is being debated. This bill would protect pregnant women from violence. Kathy Wagenthal saying the bill is about countering violence against women. But the Abortion Rights Coalition says if passed, this bill could limit reproductive rights in Canada. Well, we're now joined by Marcy Ian, the Minister for Women, Gender Equality and Youth. Marcy, good to see you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Pleasure to be with you, Michael. Listen, I want to begin uh, with the questions that were being asked today about Conservative MP Kathy uh, Wagenthal and, and her bill to protect pregnant women from violence. Now, in talking about that during the news conference, you said that you would not be tricked into, this government would not be tricked into going to places where the access to abortion is limited for women. Mm -hmm. Is that how you see Ms. Wagenthal's bill, a trick to reopen the abortion debate? Michael, the fact of the matter is uh, this particular member uh, has led several bills. There have been six bills uh, in the past several years that look a lot like this one. Uh, that would look to reopen uh, the discussion on abortion and that is something that this government will not and is never willing to do. And so, yes, whether it is, you know, a backdoor discussion or opening this discussion in a backdoor way, we're not going to do it and we will always, always stand uh, with the right to access abortions. Um, it's, it's what we were talking about earlier today, it's about access right across this country and we know that there are people behind the numbers we see. What are the numbers? One in three, one in three people who are pregnant will try to access an abortion. That's a huge number. This is what we want to talk about. This is what Canadians, frankly, want us to talk about and stand up for. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about today's announcement because your government is uh, directing just under $5 million to yes. two organizations. The aim here is to reduce barriers to abortions, but also to provide uh, what you highlighted as accurate information on reproductive health. What kind of disinformation are you concerned about? Hmm. Well, we see it online. Um, we see, you know, uh, the misinformation and disinformation, but I think Farah Khan from Action Canada highlighted things very, very well. She has a crisis hotline um, as part of um, what Action Canada does, and that hotline has seen an increase of 70%, 70% of people phoning um, with questions. And she did a very good job with saying these aren't just numbers, these are people with real stories. Young people who were looking for access to abortions, mothers who were looking for access to abortions, um, people who weren't sure where to go, who to call, picked up the phone and called those crisis lines. She, she was very, very clear in making sure that to combat any misinformation out there, that we come back with facts and not just facts, but the people behind those numbers. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you, you're saying all that, and, and, and I'm thinking about New Brunswick right now, because as you know, the only yeah. province that does not offer standalone clinics. Yes. Uh, the federal government, uh, your government, has uh, attempted to address that by essentially clawing back health funding in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. So far, that hasn't worked. So, so are you concerned uh, that the province will keep ignoring the, the issue of access to a safe abortion? Mm -hmm. You know, um, we stand and we will always stand um, for full access in every single province and territory in this country. So whether it is clawing back on monies, um, whether it is standing up for women, whether it is funding grassroots organizations so that women can access what they need to access anywhere in this country. Sometimes, Michael, that means somebody in one part of the country, I'm thinking of rural parts of this country, mm -hmm. um, find it difficult to get access, the access that they need, and can phone uh, a crisis line and get the transportation, 
get the information, uh, get the money that they need to travel somewhere else to get what they need. It's the good work of UBC as well, uh, and the CART program, as Wendy outlined today, that are looking at the disaggregated data around this, those that are underserved, indigenous, um, racialized people, 2SLGBTQI plus people, and what that looks like in those communities, often you know, rural communities, some of them, of course, urban too. So it really is about making sure that grassroots organizations, um, like the ones that were alongside me today, get what they need to serve women right across this country and serve them well. Marcy, really appreciate the time tonight. I know you have a busy schedule. Thank you for yeah. fitting, us, fitting us in. So good to be with you. Thank you so much, Michael. Take care. My parents were both teachers, and as a kid on the picket line with them, I saw firsthand the difference that politics can make for better, and in that case, worse. And if you want better, the answer is participation. Well, the person you were listening to is Nathaniel Nate Erskine-Smith, arguably best known as the Liberal MP for the Toronto riding of Beaches, East York. Well, he's now hoping to have a new title before the year is done, that of leader for the Ontario Liberal Party. And joining us right now is Nate Erskine-Smith. Uh, Nate, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, you and I were, were talking during the Liberal Convention. You said you'd be making a decision soon. Uh, here, here you are now, three days later, the first candidate to throw his hat in the ring. Why do you want to become the Liberal leader of Ontario? It's not complicated. The answer is to make the biggest difference that I can. I got involved 10 years ago because the federal party was in third place. It needed serious generational renewal. And we had a really frustrating conservative majority government, and that's where I could make the biggest difference. I left law for politics to make that difference. And all of the parallels now apply at the provincial level. We have a frustrating government that might not be as ideological, but is deeply incompetent. And we deserve better. And if you want better, then you got to participate. And so I've got a track record behind me that is different from 10 years ago. I've got a track record of getting things done, working across the aisle, shaping the government's agenda, doing politics, I think, a little bit differently. And we're in a place where we can help to rebuild the party. And I've been on the road for the last number of months and it's been successful. I know it's gonna to continue to be successful. We just have to keep at it. Oh, okay, uh, the, I, I gotta push back a little bit. You, you say incompetent, or at least not maybe push back, but at least get some clarity here. You're, you're calling the, the, the progressive conservative government of Doug Ford incompetent, and yet they still enjoy much support in the province. Just exactly uh, how is it incompetent? So let's look at healthcare. One of the greatest challenges we have Two million people don't have access to a family health team. You look at the situation in nursing and great challenges, even though we know an investment in nursing leads to better patient outcomes. And instead, what does the government respond with? It responds with a distraction around privatization. It responds with uh, capping nurses' salaries. And there's no serious action, meaningful action, to deliver on what matters most in healthcare. You look at housing, another issue that matters so much to so many people across this province, affordable housing. And frankly, for a while there, the government was saying many of the right things, building housing supply, 1.5 million homes in 10 years, and restrictive zoning. And they've done the very opposite. They're encouraging sprawl. They're not listening to their own expert task force. And they're moving us backwards when we need to build supply to keep pace with population growth. Okay, you point to 2015, though, as an example, and of course that is when the federal Liberals came into power here in Ottawa, but th there was also a bit of a change mandate, if you will, being bandied about already. Uh, is that the case right now? You know, again, it was not that long ago that the Ontario PCs not only won re-election, but won re-election with a resounding majority. They won uh, an election where not enough people participated, People didn't see politics the way I see it, one of the most important ways to make a difference. I think I've got to deliver a message that we aren't just the not Doug Ford party. The province of Ontario needs serious options to look at in any election. And we need to present a serious option that is competence, that is compassion, that is integrity, the very values I don't see at Queen's Park in this current government. And we've got to deliver big solutions to big challenges, whether it's on health care, education, housing, environmental protection, social safety net reform, and I personally, I can tell you, having traveled the province, people shrug their shoulders last election. We need to make sure that people see, the, see politics as the most important way to make a difference and get involved. Now's the time to participate. If you want better, I want better. Many people want better. Now's the time to participate because the answer is participation.
Okay, to, to, to the people in Ontario who may be asking, okay, but who is uh, Nate Erskine-Smith? Uh, your background is federal politics. Uh, you, you referenced your track record earlier, but build on that. Specifically, what can you point to as a success that you had a direct hand in bringing about in Ottawa? So I can point to a number of things. I can point to the fact that we've made it automatic and increased the Canada Workers' Benefit, lifting tens of thousands of people out of poverty. I, I introduced a caucus resolution in 2016 to do just that. We passed legislation this fall to treat drug use as a health issue, to save lives in the opioid crisis, divert people out of the healthcare system into the, uh, out, sorry, out of the justice system into the healthcare system. And that's legislation that I drafted and was supported by medical experts, was supported by the chiefs of police. I've made sure that we have stronger, more ambitious climate action, including net zero by 2050, a bill that I introduced in 2019 that became part of our 2019 platform and ultimately part of the climate accountability law. I've recently at the industry committee held grocery store executives to account for slashing pandemic pay premiums at the beginning of the pandemic. And we've seen wage fixing laws improved and strengthened as a result of that action. If you look at animal protections or privacy protections, $30 million in pediatric cancer care research, a permanent home for urban indigenous service organizations here in Toronto. On a list of files, I have helped shape the government's agenda. More importantly, when I think about my own track record, I've also done politics differently. I haven't always agreed. I've pushed this government to be better. I've disagreed at times on behalf of my community. And there's a way, as Trudeau promised, to empower communities by empowering parliamentarians. It's politics that I believe in, and it's that kind of culture that I'm going to bring to Queen's Park. Now, the Ontario Liberals are not even an official party inside the provincial legislature right now, very much stuck in third place. Oh, in terms of how you're going to do things differently, from a leader perspective, what lessons are you going to take from the past, in particular, the kind of lessons that you might take out of the missteps of former Premiers Dalton McGuinty and Kathleen Wynne? So I think there is no substitute for building and maintaining an active presence in every corner of this province. I might be a member of Parliament from Toronto, but I have visited over 50 ridings since October. I built a very strong team in Northern Ontario and Southwestern Ontario and Eastern Ontario and everywhere in between. And whether or not a community is represented by a Liberal at Queen's Park, every community deserves a strong voice in our party. That's the kind of party that I'm going to build strong, serious people who want to get involved in politics on behalf of their communities to make a difference. And that's the only way to do politics in a really serious grassroots way, bringing that kind of grassroots and generational renewal that we sorely need. Now, will you be resigning your federal seat then? Not just yet, but I am in active conversations and discussions. I've received advice that I should keep my seat the entire time. And in the end, what matters to me most is that Beaches East York is well served. So far, in the course of this exploratory tour, I've got a bill at the Health Committee. I've been active at the Industry Committee, defending consumer interests, especially in the telecommunications space. I've made sure that I was active through the budget process, just delivered a budget speech. So I've been able to wear two hats and do both jobs. But at some point, and I'm going to make this decision, decision over the summer, I've got to look and say, am I going to deliver 100% for my constituents or am I going to deliver 100% in this race? And, and I may not be able to do both. So it's an active conversation and, and I'm going to make a decision over the summer. Okay, now if you don't win the Ontario Liberal leadership, will you switch over to provincial politics? Will you try to run uh, for, for a member of provincial parliament rather than member of federal parliament? I am out to make the biggest difference that I can. And I think I've made a huge difference over the last seven and a half years with the role I have. I'm in this race to make an even bigger difference. And I'm not sure, to be honest. I I may want to do that, depending upon who the leader is, the direction of the party, the issues that the party is seized with and is going to address. And I may not, depending upon how it shakes out. So, so we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay. Uh, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith. Nate, thank you for the time this evening. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And that is our show for this Tuesday evening. I'm Michael Serapio. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow. Coming up next, though, is Esther Bejan avec l'Essentiel.